I'm gonna say, I didn't hear anybody say, it's Brooklyn in the house. It's Brooklyn in the house. It's Brooklyn in the house. I'm gonna do it all fucking day. I'm gonna do it all fucking day. Stop screaming. It's Brooklyn in the house. Come on, let's screw It's Brooklyn in the fucking house. It's Brooklyn in the house! It's Brooklyn in the house! It's like one of the perfect cities. They got perfect roads, they got perfect bike lanes, they got perfect bikes, they got perfect people, everybody's in shape. They got perfect trucks, they got perfect boats, everything is like, hey, it's like Disneyland for adults who love a beautiful city. All right, you guys, we come from New York, another famous boating city in the world. This is Frank and Frank. But we're, we're chefs and we're friends with Rene Rizepi and we, we, we support the, the Mad Food Symposium, which is this, you, do you know about it? No, it's happening uh, Sunday, Monday. Rene has brought people from all over the world and chefs from all over the world. Tomorrow, seven in the morning, sharp. All right, chef. Yes, we, chef. We chef. Yes, chef. <laughs> Copenhagen has been packed with good restaurants insane cooks in the kitchen working maniac hours for the benefit of the guests. These type of places have been around for a long time. I don't know, I guess it was natural that, that we also had to have a, a strong meeting place. And maybe, just maybe, you know, maybe, just maybe, that the fact that there is this culinary zeitgeist in Copenhagen at the moment, if it wasn't for all the great restaurants here, maybe Matt's Symposium wouldn't be as successful. What he's done for the city is Insane city for the region. Hey, that's what you, sometimes that's what you have to do to take to, to, to make to make strides and gains and to really believe in what you're doing. He's got all these people now coming here from all over the world to talk about food. So Mad Symposium is a is a is a forum for cooks and food professionals from around the globe. Frank had heard about it first, and then uh, we wound up converging on 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 Copenhagen. We fell in love with it, we fell in love with the people, we, we felt that it was the real, the real deal in terms of those types of symposiums and that, you know, more than anything, the knowledge and what the knowledge would do would actually change people's lives and, and, the, and, and the industry that we, we all work in. I mean, Matt is like the place, it's the spot. There's great people of the world, they go in, they meet, they talk, they're on the same page and then they go out to their lands and their countries and they, you know, they promote the, hopefully, you know, the right vibe, and the right thing. We're here, man. Yeah, we're good, man. We got great weather this year. All right, just one more plum. Where are, we, where are you putting the pits? On the floor. All right. All right. So, Jesus, we're a big team today, man. Holy shit. <laughs> what we've been planning a year is going to start. Okay? And for those of you who tried it the other years, it's the same as usual. The only thing that changed is that we put a seed in the ground year one. That now is a roaring monster of expectation and commitment from our side. I was getting fed up with, with the conferences that I was invited to myself. And instead of always fucking complaining, I thought, okay, well, do something better yourself then. And that was sort of the seed of it. Just wanting to have a place where the cooks could meet Restaurant folks from around the world could meet and we could discuss new ideas and, and sort of understand a bit where our industry is today and where it's going. It's our third edition. Year one, we had visitation. Year two, the theme was appetite. This year it's guts and we hope that people will delve into stories that they usually don't dare to say. Kitchens today are filling up with vacuum packers, sous vides, probes and all the other stuff. And sometimes the instinctive part seems to get lost. Why Rene does it? is because he's the guy that wants to pull together chefs because he's passionate about it. I would like that there's a monster behind us ready to chew up on us if we are not staying ahead of the game. And so far we're staying pretty much ahead of the game. Norma and Rene have spawned a movement and a consciousness at an, on another level. Norma, to be honest, popped up on my radar when it became the top restaurant in the world. I'd love to say that I knew about it before it got big, but that's not true. 
people here, like is, as is happening in Mexico or in Brazil or in other countries, sort of stop looking f to Europe, to like France or, or any other country and sort of looking within and trying to do something with that and trying to express themselves with what, what they had around them. Good morning, everybody. Are you ready for Mad 3? Yeah. We're ready to let you into the tent now. Welcome to the third annual Mad Symposium. In terms of the speakers that come, it's not only superstars. I think Renee probably brought me here because he wanted to up the black gay Jewish population of Denmark by a new high. I think that it, it really makes me feel welcome. I don't always feel welcome in culinary circles, especially at home. Um, they can be very nepotistic and very clothed and very velvet rope. And um, there is this cult of personality around the idea of being a popular chef that I don't, um, the democratic socialist in me does not agree with. I'm learning from every continent in the world. Every type of man and woman is here and um, all educating each other. Most conferences are still dominated by programs where chefs basically just cook a dish, demo it and show off what their, what their new invention is, what their new trick is. Here there's practically none of that. Um, it's a forum for ideas and for knowledge. And if I'm not doing physics today, if I'm not doing quantum theory, it's because in the 80s I started to get a gut sense that something was very wrong with our agriculture systems. The commonality that, they, that everybody has is that everybody that here is a leader of a constituency of their circle of influence. Like you can turn around to anybody and strike up a conversation and that conversation you find out he writes for the time, London Times or he writes for the then though and this one you know it's curated so that the real heads come they get the information they go out and disseminate it to the world. That's the genius of what he's doing with his number one status. I was like you know everybody who's here is like top level of food people I'm like you know this is not this guy not a bunch of bones my partner Frank 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 Cancinelli Casanova Italian American Italian American Italian 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 okay yeah, but we're all Italian and I hate the I hate the term larger than life character but Dario is certainly that um, and that was clearly on display at MAD uh, he's sort of this consummate craftsman uh, he, he spoke about the dying breed of, of butchers and of people that actually engage food, that have a connection to it, that have been following a tradition for decades and centuries that goes back generations. Yeah, Dario Ticini was really, had a, had a serious impact. That was amazing. That was the best presentation ever. And for me, in everything I've seen, I mean, I've seen them all, from, from the first one to this one. This guy, this guy blew it away, man. La mia famiglia fanno l'arte dei macellai da 250 anni. In una famiglia di macellai si mangia, si cresce mangiando quello che gli altri non vogliono comprare. When he, I think when he pulled the heart, the liver <laughs> and the lungs out and he put that on the table and he just looked at it and he's like that's it right there man. That's gonna be a fucking hard act to follow, man. Stand up. Damn. That made me, that made me cry, man. That was incredible. Incredible. Incredible, man. No, but I've been to three of these. That was the, the best ever. Oh, you're so kind. Not, it's, not, it. it's not being kind, it's real, man. <laughs> As you know, when you stand up and you're like, oh, I'm fucking glad I'm Italian, man. <laughs> uh, Frank and I really aspire to, uh, you know, study as, as, you know, like you look, if you look at yoga as a practice and if you look at, at being a chef as a practice, you know, to prove we, we aspire to the practice of, you know, what Alan Ducasse has accomplished, John George has accomplished, these great operators who yep. not only use their back and they use their wit, but they use their intelligence and their business sense to become greater than the guy that's just the cook. Guys, we have Alan Ducasse.
So at the symposium this year, the biggest star of them all, the shining, the shining star, the number one is definitely Ella Ducasse. Uh, Ducasse is probably, you know, he's, a, he's in a class by himself, let's just say that. You know, he's Ducasse class. 90% of all the cooks in the audience, they just want to swoon over Ella Ducasse. Les, les, les étoiles, c'est important. Ouais. L'important, c'est le plaisir que l'on a à partager sa connaissance au service des clients et au service des artisans, des éleveurs, des pêcheurs, de la nature qui nous ont offert de préparer au service du client. C'est ça le plus important. You know, talking about stars, um, stars is, is, is not something in itself. It's good to have them, but we can live without. And you know, to him, what is much more important is the relationship that you are developing years after years or time after time with your clients, but also with all your, your type staff. of purveyors, your, your staff, staff, your collaborators, and you know, the fishermen, the, um, the foragers, and you know, all the people that um, you, you have to live with, you live with with pleasure. It was, the, it was everybody looking at the top, like, and now you have a guy like Alain Ducasse who's looking at the raw grassroots coming up what's going on and food movement, which is all these young chefs, and it's about sharing ideas. It's a very great pleasure for me to invite you here and to meet you and to exchange with you the little bit of time of the day. And being invited here, you know, by, by, by you and, and sharing with you and exchanging with you is a perfect example of, of what he is really, you know, super happy to, uh, to do. So, David thank you again. René, merci pour cette belle initiative. So David and René, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We participated in a study uh, about carbon footprint. Chris Ying asked them, uh, he was doing a, uh, a project on carbon emissions at restaurants, which, is, which seems to be uh, an area that's quite unexplored and, and should be investigated a little bit more. You know, I go on at 420. That's, I think they did it on purpose. Can't believe it, man. I'm gonna go change. So I wanted to invite Rene from Noma and Frank Castronovo and Frank Falsinelli from Frankie's in New York to come up and join us for this next presentation. I really wanted to see how bad a meal at a popular New York restaurant that I would maybe go to instead of cooking at home, or maybe I would choose to cook at home instead of going out. How close it could be to being as good for the environment as eating at home, or maybe better than eating at home. It was us and Noma, it was Frankie Spuntino and Noma. They put us up and they, you know, went through our garbage and how much garbage we use and how much electricity we use and how much gas we use and water and everything and how much we, you know, waste we create. And we did extremely well. Frankie's is one kilogram of carbon dioxide away. That's, that's so close. It's within striking distance of, of being able to say, you know, with, with a little nipping and tucking here or whatever, like we're, if you eat at our restaurant tonight, it's better for the environment than eating at home. It was enlightening. It also made me think about what, what more we can do. You know, we like to be a part of production at MAD, like in any way. Oh, you guys shucking? Are you guys doing fucking jalapenos, man? I, I want to get in here, man. Yeah. I mean, just anything you want. Walk station, rock station. <laughs> I'll fucking do it, man. <laughs> and also, it's nice to be part of the contribution when people are eating because it's the most memorable part of the afternoon yeah. other than the presentations. Yeah. Our job this year was just to make food. So we, like, we made the lunch of a family meal for 600 of the best chefs in the world and food journalists and everything else. That was the world's most exciting buffet. <laughs> and it went, it went for miles, man. I was like, holy shit. We cooked for 600 people in an hour and a half. And again, it's, it's not like it's some street fair or something, it's like the best chefs. It's crazy. It's good for me and, and, and my peace of mind to know that anything is possible. 
I think Mission Chinese Food and the whole scheme of things, it's more about like the team of people that work with us. So the team I brought with me this year was Zach Swimley, he's a chef de cuisine of Mission Chinese Food in New York. Angela Dumi Yugar, executive chef. Broker Lag couldn't be here, she was with us in spirit. And it was hard, that was hard for me because Angela's like my right arm, you know, like my left arm. She's like everything to me. And we got we brought Jesse Coity from from San Francisco, the chef in San Francisco, Anthony Mint, my business partner, and the guy that helped me start. We, we started this whole thing together. And then uh, one of my best friends, the world Brandon Jew, who is basically the reason they started making Chinese food. He kind of introduced me to Sichuan food. We had a ton of helpers from Noma. But uh, so the Franks helped us out today and they, they said, well, we'll help you cook. We'll be there. I didn't think they literally meant that they would help us cook, but they did. Just man do. So I'm, 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 your, I'm your team partner. You want some shrimp? Yeah, don't take all the shrimp, man. I only got one load. Yeah, that's all we got. It's fucking unbelievable. It's hard, man. I mean, it's work. You know, we sweat our, we sweat our ass off last, last time. Everybody get in the fucking line! <laughs> that was a lot of work, but I gotta say the, the, the real hard part about that whole thing was the preparation. <laughs> we did the, you know, we had fun. They, they really, those guys busted their asses to prep. All right, we're in business. We're opening the restaurant. I was like, why does Frank want to give me all this information? Why does he want to help me so much? I don't understand. What does he want out of it? And, and the answer is nothing. You know, he just, I feel like Frank, Frank Falsinelli, he, I think he really enjoys things that are new, you know, and also ushering people into this because he's been through it. He's seen it. The energy gets passed around when he's, and he gets excited and you get excited and you get to like feed off of each other. And um, it was always just a good, a good burst of energy to have them. And if you know, following them around, I'm sure you see that like, they're just the most happy, energetic, you know, they're really great people. The Bears, how you doing? Bears, Bears. He's the hardest working man in restaurants. He shares the spotlight, he shares the stage, he shares his shit. Well, I just, I'm a firm believer in that like, you have to give back to people to help you get wherever you go. And if, again, like I said earlier, I wouldn't be able to open the restaurant without you guys again. There's no handbook to opening a restaurant. But, you know, I don't know. It's like, it was an amazing experience. I mean, Alain Ducasse was queuing in line. Like, he was waiting in line for a second. And I was just like, that's insane. It's like, when is the last time that Alain Ducasse waited in line anywhere? Yeah. He, no, he makes the line. He doesn't wait for one. I know. So. Yeah, that was great, man. That was yeah. I mean, it's insane. And then, you know, the more you think about it, like, it hasn't really hit me totally that that happened. It went by so fast. But, no. like, you know, just having people there that you can, like, enjoy it with. You know, it's an honor, a privilege, and it's, you know, if anybody's going to do it, it's being frank. Yeah. That's being frank. You find yourself in that situation with the best. Yeah, it's a great experience. It's a pleasure. It's a, like Frank said, it's a pleasure and an honor. And you know, I, I I just want to make sure it keeps going on. Life was just a dream. I used to read Word Up Gourmet magazine. We bring the fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We bring the fun. F right? for Frank and Frank and fun. What are we doing in this episode of Being Frank and Peru, Frank? We're gonna do a little Lima with uh, Gaston. We're gonna go to Paracas Bay and dive for scallops. Oh! <laughs> and we're gonna go to Iquitos in the Amazon. What is what that? What the fuck is that? I don't know. Oh, God. Hope we get some prosciutto here. The ingredients are so specific to this landscape. Where else are you gonna taste that? Nowhere, man. <laughs> all these different chefs that we met on this trip, that they're all doing it in their own way. Pedro Miguel's Amazon cuisine and Virgilio Martinez's altitude cuisine. Turtle soup, man. Very French. This is high-end gastronomy, ladies Welcome and gentlemen. Welcome to Peru. We have thousands and thousands of ingredients to discover and to put on the table. And it's just the beginning. <laughs>